John, uh, you've been through a variety of situations which have challenged people's resilience at home and abroad and in Scotland. Over to you. So um, there's lots to pick up on, on what both Claire and Neil have said. Um, and one thing when Claire said, um, it's not rocket science, it reminded me of a meeting I was in, a public meeting in, uh, in Edinburgh, where uh, an anguished, angry, concerned Morningside, middle class uh, matron from Morningside, got up and said, it's not rocket salad, um, which was true. <laughs> It definitely wasn't rocket salad. Um, and I always, I mean, I always like to think about resilience as, in strategic terms, it's having, it's having reversibility, but being able to reverse to a point and then re-advance to the objective that you're trying to get to. And that really depends on you knowing where you're going to, and that also depends on knowing where you're coming from. I think it is really important to take the time, particularly in leadership positions, but I think for all of us, to take the time to step back a bit and go, why are we here? It's not just what's going on, but why are we here? How did we get here? And it seems to me that there's a lot of things which we engage with which are actually symptoms. They're not the cause. Um, Brexit is a symptom, it's not a cause. No deal is a symptom, not a cause. Trump is a symptom. Uh, Farage is a symptom. Corbyn's a symptom. Uh, and the question is, what are they a symptom of? And I think they're a symptom of... I used to think they were a simple symptom. Not that symptom, but based in superstructure. That there's something deeply going wrong economically, and therefore socially, politically, there's bound to be profound expressions. The global financial crisis, the Great Recession, um, that we're still living with the consequence of that, ten years on. Uh, the world was nearly, you know, the world nearly went into depressions. Nearly, the whole economy crashed by bankers. Uh, banks were bailed out with taxpayers' money. Taxpayers haven't had a pay rise for a decade, and bankers haven't gone to jail. Now it's kind of quite easy to see why people would get annoyed by that, but I think. It's not simply, I think, I, was, I, was in, I went to the UN General Assembly last year to the circus around Unger, and it was you know, low party conference time. I was very pleased not to be at low party conference. Um, I said to people, I wasn't going to go to Nuremberg this year. Um, <laughs> however, this year I will be at Nuremberg, um, uh, Brighton as they call it. Um, I was sitting there having a drink with a friend, uh, a professor of philosophy, who's a friend of mine, and it was it's, it's the end of September and it was balmy and warm and wet. And we both were reflecting on how unseasonal the weather was, but actually how unseasonal all weather is now. And that actually, I think people are being driven mad by climate change. I think there's a deep concern amongst the public. They'd, it's gone beyond, are you, do you believe in it or not? There's a deep and profound unsettling feeling that it's not, there's the, there's the trope that people have which is the younger generation won't be as well off as their parents. That's just nonsense. The younger generation will be as well off as their parents. They'll be much better off than their parents. Um, there's no chance they'll be less well off to start with. They'll inherit my house so that my generation will do really well inheriting my house. Um, but there's something about, I think in most parents and grandparents have a suspicion that while the world might see them out and it might even see their children out, it might not see their grandchildren or their great-grandchildren out. There's something about the end of, there's something realistic about the end of times. Richard in the audience has just come back from Australia. I've worked in Australia. Australia is a country which parts of uh, are being made uninhabitable by uh, the change in the, uh, in the weather systems. So there's something about climate change and something about the economics. And then I actually think, um, I read some Baudrillard over the summer, and um, I think he wrote some great essays on 9-11. 9-11 is a profound crisis that I don't think we've actually incorporated into our thinking about the world. 9-11 was, was the end of a period of globalization in which the weapons of global, in which the symbols, emblems of globalization were turned against globalization itself. So, Intercontinental planes were flown into the World Trade Center. 
Not simply that. The ability of people to use money to travel, to, to learn, to get skills. So Saudi nationals travelled to America to train how to fly planes, which is part of, we all believe, progressives believe in, get on through education, get on through skills, get on through upskilling, get on through migration. All of those values, symbols, emblems ended up with people paying to train to skill themselves so they could fly a plane into the emblems uh, of globalization, whether it's the Pentagon or whether it's the... And I think that's unsettled people in a deep way because that made people understand that the fluidity with which capital moves around the world and the fluidity with which people move around the world has consequences which you might want to deal with. And I think the unfortunate part of this is the only political response to that that's been at all effective is actually it's the kind of Trump Farage Orban, which is build a bigger barrier, build a bigger border. I don't think that's the correct response, but actually you can see why that's a reassuring response to voters who kind of go, it's fair enough when progressives say not everybody wants to come into our country as a terrorist, but it's also fair enough to say terrorism is quite a big and random threat and something should be done about it. So we've got economic security, environmental security, national security, all of these up in the air for more than a decade. In those circumstances, the question is, where are we going? And it's kind of, at the moment, we're kind of just surviving, sort of. And I think the change, the, the change element of it is quite difficult, isn't it? Because 10 years ago, driverless cars were going to be here in 10 years' time. And I reckon in 10 years' time, driverless cars will still be going to be 10 years uh, away from us. Be because the, there's a great book um, called The Shock of the Old, um, which is, to, to a great extent, it talks about, I mean, I talked about jet planes. Jet, jet plane, jets were the, jet engines were the invention of the, night of the interwar years. Um, there were more horses used in the Second World War than were used in the First World War. There's a lot, there's a long, long lag in old technology. Old technology still structures, just as old <laughs> habits, old cultures, old organizational habits uh, structure us. And so, the, 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 where we're going is a bigger and a deeper and a harder question for us to answer. And again, is it, are we just responding to driverless cars are going to change? What, what are driverless cars, cars going to change for most people living in most parts of the UK? Very little for a very long time because the density of the uh, investment in infrastructure for uh, the information infrastructure that can guide driverless vehicles is going to be. It will be in certain places, really, really important, but driverless cars aren't going to help you uh, in the country if you want to go out and get absolutely wellied and get home without getting a uh, drink driving. Thing. You're going to still need a, a taxi driver of some sort. Um, and the question about where we're going takes us to, again, I think, uh, really the, the main point of what I've been considering about resilience. To have resilience, you have a strategy. To have a strategy, you actually need to make a considered view about where you're going to. And it was Claire that said, <coughs> talked about organizations that had shopping lists and we're going to focus on their priorities. I think anybody who's got a shopping list doesn't have a strategy. They've just got, I mean, they've got a PowerPoint slide. And we know in the world of PowerPoint slides with bullet points, that's the world in which, you know, I've got five demands and you've got four demands, so I beat you by five to four, like it's a football match. The most successful organizations, the most successful leaders, the most successful uh, strategies are in the end based on a story, based on a narrative of where I've come from, where I'm going and how I'm going to get there. And I think that, that the, the, the gap in many ways, and I think it's where, it's where it was good for the health service that the five-year money was made available together with a five-year plan, which, which, does ha which, which has in it strengths and weaknesses, which are the, the weakness that I think Niall points out, which is the, how do you deal with healthcare on its own? The answer is you have to deal with the bit that you have control of. So NHS England deals with the, the health service while it has the health service and has to gradually move towards the other bits. But it offered a menu of, of ways in which organisations could develop and grow their health economies in the local areas. It was directive, but not prescriptive. Uh, it gave you a sense of where you're going to and gave you 
uh, the power to pick and choose. And I think that may well be part of where organizations are going in the future because anybody who is involved in any part of life uh, knows the truth uh, of, of, that, of that, that great management saying, which is that everybody, every organization is full of people who are talented, energetic, imaginative, innovative, collaborative, excited, and engaging, except for the eight hours a day they turn up to work in the organization.